Welcome to 217faith.church, the church that fits your schedule. We wish you a very Merry Christmas as we are almost upon the day of birth of our Redeemer who left the side of the Father in heaven to come as a baby to earth so that you and I may have a sure path back into the loving arms of God. Have you experienced this amazing gift of love and hope and peace and joy? It is what the season is about. That's what we want to talk about today. So please don't wait any longer. In the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians, the church in Galatia, he spells out the events of the Christmas morning. So let's go there in chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 for some context. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters, because you are his children. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you and I are no longer slaves, but we are God's children. And since we are God's children, God has made us also heirs. May God grant us wisdom as we study his word together. Paul begins by telling us that it was not by chance, by design. He says that when the appointed time had come, God sent his son. You see, what we often give over to faith or to lock of the draw, God has ordained in a divine calendar, a calendar that remains uh, unciphered by humanity, but one that dictates the work of grace that God performs for the sake of humanity. In the Hebrew prophecy uh, that is called the Bereshit, we learn that all the way back in Genesis 1-1, the plan was always to redeem the human race. And still God creates us, knowing that we will reject them because he wants us to ultimately choose him. He wants us to freely choose him, to have that choice. This is why often our prayers might go unanswered. Hear me out. When we simply ask God to do this and that and this and that for us, God can't simply say yes because some of those requests might invalidate our God-given right to choose for ourselves. Yes, sometimes we have to take a step in faith. The secret is in our choosing. Many decisions in our lives require our choosing. Yes, of course, it is not a task that God leads to us alone uh, to complete on our own, but we can trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, and we can live by the example of Jesus Right that he says, and ask him to help us to make the right choice. As Paul says, that very spirit that will live in us will call out to God. The word Abba is very similar to the term Daddy. So we call out to our Father above in full intimacy, not merely the creator of the universe, but our Dad, who cares for us very much. Because in this, the scripture says we are given, we are forgiven and given adoption into God's family. And we're made heirs into the kingdom of God. And I know some of you may say, forgiven for what, boy? I, I'm a pretty good person. I take care of my own. I help people when I can. I try to obey the laws of my hand. That's great. But that's merely a reaction to who you are, who you have become, right, inside, based on the influences around you. And while you may be what the world may call a good person, what motivates that? Is it selfishness, advancement, true altruism? Have you ever wondered where that benevolence comes from? According to the scriptures, we believe that God is the creator of all things. Indeed, when humanity was created, we are told that it was done, that our creation was done in the image of God, which speaks about the characteristics of God. Then, of course, we have good old Romans 8, 28. That reminds us that God can use all things according to his purpose and bring good out of all situations. We're also reminded of scriptures that we're able to love because God first loved us. The Apostle James, writing to the church, says that every good gift and perfect gift comes from the Father of life, the Father of love, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We'll talk about gifts in just a second. We are not good because we evolved into it, but because it is in our God-given DNA. It is in our, as building us to the characteristics of God for us to be kind and merciful and gracious. A DNA, again, designed in the image of God. Well, now I know that you're making this up. Have you looked around? Have you seen the human race? We're pretty terrible creatures. And it's true, we can be. Inventing evil, taking advantage of one another, imposing our will on the weak and on the poor. Absolutely. 
But let's remember this is why we need a Savior in the first place. We have rebelled against God's ways and his goodness in such a way that the only way for us to be brought back is for God to send the sacrificial lamb, his son, for us. Human act evil, not because of godly characters, but because of the evil influence that are around us that lead us to make poor choices. Yes, unfortunately, that very same free will that God grants us leads some of us to choose selfishly. The human heart will always seek the selfish things that it wants, anything but God. Yet only a closer walk with him leads us to true benevolence. And while walking away from him, dictated by, by selfishness, it leads us to do whatever it takes to satisfy himself, including evil acts towards others, that's what's going to get us in trouble. Now, I know some of those who say, well, then why bother, Moy? Why not just create a paradise where we can live in harmony with God without the need for evil? Well, he already did that. That's how our existence began in the garden of, of the paradise, right? Humanity walked with God and enjoyed the creation. But due to poor choices, disobedience, yes, that's a choice. We all have the choice not to sin. Those choices introduced selfish desires, which affected that godly DNA in us, right? That sin became like a radiation that mutated the human DNA from a godly perspective to a worldly perspective. Seeking closeness with God and uh, causing us to lead ourselves to hide, to try to hide from him. That sin radiation slowly degraded our ability to do good for his honor and glory. And still, God continues to seek to return us, to heal us from our sinful condition. Indeed, one day upon his return, we are, those who remain faithful will return to him. But in time, you see, the natural laws of God can be seen in this we, we do not murder other people just because we're good people or because we have accepted God's goodness. No, we don't murder other people because we know it's wrong. That's the nature of God. So where does that perceived order of things come from? It doesn't come from evolution, that's for sure. I have no formal training, but I do love science. I do. And I love to learn how things work. And recently we were watching a scientific show on the loss of thermal dynamics. Please don't feel bad. I had to look this up. I didn't know anything about this before I saw this show. But as I processed what was being shared, and as I Googled and looked for some information, I began to comprehend some of the things that were saying. And even today, my observations, I, I, I granted they're elementary at best. My approach, uh, I, I just try to look at it from an intuitive kind of way, which I think it can be eye-opening even. You see, scientists have identified a series of natural laws that they call the laws of thermal dynamics. These laws govern the behaviors or the qualities of heat and other energies. And it provides a quantitative description, a way to explain how these things work. Many in the secular scientific world like to think of a creation point for the existence of all things that were brought by a series of, of accidental random steps, which they call evolution or the Big Bang. And from that, we have the order of creation which we experience today. That's what they tell us. Yet the same scientists tell us that entropy or disorder is the natural journey of all things. Did you hear that? Unless there is an outside energy that is applied, it will go into disorder. Now, I don't know why this doesn't work for scientists. For me, it tells me that there's an intentional influence upon creation, a creator that has encouraged order rather than disorder. All you have to do is look outside, and you can see the beautiful order. You can see the beautiful hand of the creator, right? And it's not something that just came out of happenstance or random disorder steps. The third law of thermodynamics, which is actually the fourth, because you see they, they've actually identified a new law, which they call the zero law, because the other three were already established, and now the new one they call zero. So the third law of thermodynamics, scientists believe that it is what essentially will allow us to quantify the absolute amplitude of entropy, right, or disorders. Basically, it says this. When you consider a totally perfect, 100% pure crystalline structure at absolute zero, it will have no entropy. It will have no order. And external energy will need to be applied. Otherwise, things will go from disorder into greater disorder. This is the natural course of things, right? If left to their own Evolution, things will go into greater disorder. As a result, 
even by the very laws of thermodynamics, that it's not possible for an explosion or the Big Bang to create order unless an external energy was applied. I simply call this energy God, who holds creation itself in his hand. You can search our website. We did a message recently on this topic of the moment of creation. I think you will enjoy it and be blessed. Because of this same divine order of things, God has always had a plan for the crown of his creation, which is you and I, humanity. Our sinful nature did not catch him by surprise. Our rebellion against what, what he said we, we should and should not do does not shock him. Our denial of his goodness you know, in, in us does not disappoint him. He knew about it. And as such, applied his will, his energy, in order to bring order into the chaos of our lives. It works in our individual lives. Have you ever felt that due to choices that you've made in your life, that your life was spinning out of control? And in that moment, a, a bit of wisdom, you sought the Lord and his help, and you prayed, and what did he do? He helped you. He provided grace, which produced peace and brought calmness and order into your situation. Every year, we must remind ourselves of the real reason for this season. You see, the world's going to try to twist it and deny its true beginnings, but we must not. We must carry the torch of, of joy and grace, and despite all those things that we may have done, that perhaps we thought caused God to completely lose all hope in us, he sent the Son to pay for every single one of my sins, every single one of your sins, that we might be drawn back into his loving arms. I work in retail, and you would think Christmas is about uh, buying disposable stuff that barely lasts for a year, uh, from one year to the next, all under the rationale of celebrating Christmas. Yet we know that Jesus, who is the real reason for the season, had nothing. He was so poor according to worldly standards that he could not find a place to, to even be born. And he had to find shelter in a place that was separated to maintain animals, a, a, a nativity place, right? Yet today we think that in order to celebrate the events of his birth, we must buy more stuff. Of course, it makes sense for the retail uh, side of the world. They're a business and trying to make money. But from a consumer perspective, from a Christian perspective, we must be careful. For spending all this money on decorations and gifts has nothing to do with the real reason why Jesus came. You see, we like to believe in Sabbath because he represents benevolence and joy. He brings us gifts that we are good and answers our letters and wishes. Yet God is reminding us at Christmas that we do not need to invent a replacement goodness for he already exists. He has always existed. The scriptures reminds us that God is good, that he is love, that he is faithful. He calls us friends and he sends his son to take our place that we deserve. He gives us all good gifts, as we read earlier, and his purpose for our lives is unlike anything we can imagine and more valuable than, than any material thing we can hope for or that we can ever ask. You know, something that bothers me, we keep telling kids that Santa brought them this, and some kids get, get iPads and game systems, and yet other children whose parents cannot afford extravagant gifts are left to believe in, in that Santa brought them socks or clothing or maybe some hand-me-down toys. Why would Santa bring good gifts to their friends but ignore them? Because he's not real. And we as Christians need to stop perpetuating these lies. All good gifts come from our Father above. Sure, some parents can afford to buy more stuff for their kids uh, that, that God provides from others. But the invaluable gift to salvation is for all who accept. We love to watch Christmas movies uh, during the season, of course. And one of our favorite ones is actually The Polar Express. You know the movie? They, they, they take children on this train so they can go out to the North Pole and experience Santa in a personal way in order to, to kindle their faith in him once again. Now again, as wonderful as this idea of Santa is, there are many in the world who will never receive a gift for Christmas, no matter how good they are. Therefore, the belief in Santa can eventually lead some of these children as they grow old to lose faith in God. I hate to break it to you, but Santa is not real. 
parents work hard to provide gifts for their children. Let's not steal that from them. Let's teach our children where those things are coming from, from our work. Instead, we must learn to put our hope in God always and believe in him. Rekindle our relationship with him daily and live our lives for his purpose. But wait, I, I still hear some of you saying, well, boy, there's plenty of Christians around the world living in poverty. And I would agree with you. But that's the answer that's always given. Sure. That's the response that we hear, uh, but it's not necessarily a true statement. You see, while many of us don't live in mansions or have extra cash in the magnitudes of a small country, poverty, in a sense, is something is a concept of the mind. One that's created, I believe, by society, by governments, in, in, in the hopes of controlling us, right? Every election cycle, you hear about the working poor, the middle class, and our rich overlords who will take care of everything and make it better for if you think you're poor, then you will always be poor. If you choose to let others provide for you rather than you seek God's strength and find the means to provide for yourself and for your family, which we can all choose to do, then you'll never accumulate anything but what is given to you. Yes, I thank God that I'm not poor in the sense that I'm, I'm living on the streets, but that's because I work. My wife works. We apply ourselves. We seek God's guidance. And as he leads us, we act. We try to make better choices in our life, choices that hopefully lead us into further prosperity that, that God provides rather than despair. Now, by the way, God provides this prosperity so that we may go and bless others along the way, not just to keep it. And along the way, God walks with us. We have learned to tune our ears to his guidance, and he blesses our lives so that we may do the same for others. The choice we make in this life can have negative effects in, in the quality of our lives and even the lives of others. Even though the forgiveness of Christ or through his forgiveness, uh, though we may have not no possessions, we can be rich in his love and future hope, future hope of an eternity. Friends, God always answers prayers. Even when he says no, he always provides for the needs of his children who faithfully follow his will and supply the gifts that we require and need. And he does it as we seek his goodness and His and acknowledge his faithfulness, acknowledge his righteousness. I remember during the height of the COVID pandemic when many people were struggling, I was working 60, 70 hours a week. And as tiring as I was, I was very grateful that God had provided for our family. All out of faithful obedience on my part. I could have stayed home and taken what was being given. You can test God on this all you want. He will always come through. Live faithful, obedient lives. And he has promised that you will want for nothing. Remember when Jesus was born, eventually one of the three gifts that he received was gold. And because of that, some have claimed that Jesus was rich. Yet, what did he and his parents have to do a couple of years after he was born? They had to flee to Egypt for their lives, and they stayed there for several years. You see, he wasn't rich or poor, but in fact, God had provided for their security. God always provides for the needs of his children. It may not be a sports car. It may not be a, a 10 room mansion, but God always provides for the needs of his children. We must spend celebrate Christmas every year, remind ourselves of God's faithfulness because it is the culmination of God's promise and blessing to restore the human race from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the birth of Christ. God's promised desire has always been the same, to give us the best gift of all, the, the gift of hope and salvation, and to restore our DNA back to this day. Why do we gather with families at Christmas? Well, it's an opportunity to start afresh. A new year with new occasions to make better choices and repair poor ones. In Jesus' time, there was a census that caused his mom and dad to have to travel. Nowadays, we'll, we'll weather storms and crowded airports to reconnect with our families and spend time in fellowship and love. Times that help us to uh, fortify God's goodness in our lives. Yes, I understand that from time to time, us getting together uh, can be because of occasions, due to occasions of sadness and grief. But even in those times, God promises to be with us as we call out to his name for grace. 
Why do we give gifts then to each other? Why? Because Jesus is the greatest gift given. Naturally, when the kings came to visit him, they brought him gifts out of respect. You see, they recognized this baby. They knew that he was the one, true king, the son of God, sent to bring humanity the hope that we so desperately needed. Even today, in the absence of, of God's light, as many of us continue to live in darkness due to poor choices, despair rules our heart, sadness fills our thoughts, and we conclude that there's no reason to live. Yet at the appointed time, God sends his son. This is God's appointed time to send his son into your life, into my life. We must receive and we must learn then to keep Christmas the right way and celebrate his true meaning every second of our lives, whether we can give each other gifts or not. Another movie we enjoy is A Christmas Carol, based on the, uh, uh, the book by Charles Dickens. And we see what happens when we choose to make better choices, choices that include helping and serving others, refusing to merely seek the what benefits the self. May we be reminded today as, as we perhaps are already amongst our loved ones or, or planning to travel to them, or even if your plan is to be all by yourself this Christmas, this year, remind ourselves of the real reason for this season. It's not about the gifts, although they should remind us of the gift of God's love and salvation towards us. It's not so much about being with family. And still, this reminds us of God's desire to be in community with us. Let us rejoice that at a time such as this, God sent his son to restore us to himself, to save us, that we may repent from our sins. May we always keep Christmas in our hearts. Remember your blessings and all the ways we have we can bless each other. May God make his purpose clear in each of our lives. May he convict us of those things that we must change, that we must repent from, all those things that we must leave behind so that we can become his true children, his true friends. Father, on the eve of this year's Christmas Day, we thank you for your complete plan of redemption, a plan that you had in place even before the first one of us chose to run from you. Lord, no matter how far we may try to run, you are there waiting for us to return. And when we do, when we do come to our senses and return to you, you do not judge us. You forgive us and you accept us. Help us indeed, Lord, to turn away from our sin, to sin no more, and instead to dedicate our lives to keeping Christmas in our hearts by blessing us in service and prayer, and through, through the ministry of Christ. May it be so far, and may we willingly do so for your honor and your glory. For we pray these things in the name of he for which this season exists, Christ our Savior. Amen. Oh, holy night, the stars are bright, they shine. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt it
grateful to have had you join us in our service, and we pray that you will be motivated to put your faith in God into action. Please visit our ministry website at 217faith.church, or as you watch us on YouTube or Facebook or on X, help us to spread the word by liking and sharing and clicking those notifications below. It is wonderful that we can spend this Christmas time with you, and we pray for a blessed time with you and your family. So like I said, even if it's just you this year. If you would like to support our evangelistic efforts, please access our, our Patreon account and become a contributor, truly an enabler of this ministry. Uh, we'll add that description in, uh, in the, this, that, that link in the description. So we thank you. You know, God's calling humbles us to preach his message of hope and love and invitation. But we want you to join us. We want your help so that we can reach more who surely need God's wonderful words of grace today. So would you visit our ministry website, 217faith.church, utilize the many resources that we have there, and share it. Let others know as you walk in your own Christian experience. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face to you and grant you peace. Merry Christmas to you, and may God bless us, everyone.